Greetings APUSH scholars for our review on Unit 11, Imperialism, the Spanish-American War, and World War I, with some comments on building the Panama Canal and China and Panama. So I'm looking at the review sheet from top to bottom here, reasons for U.S. imperialism after the Civil War. Well, a number of things change after the Civil War as you have industrial growth, industrial expansion in the North and in the Midwest as the West fills in. The United States is going to become increasingly powerful and we're going to be able to look overseas. And we're kind of the Johnny come lately to the game of imperialism. The Europeans are out of the gate first. And if you remember any world history, the Europeans have uh, taken most of Africa and much of um, much of Asia. And when we're looking at the Spanish-American War, specifically, there's some reasons for this war. One is to liberate the Cubans from oppression. There's this belief in you know, the Monroe Doctrine that the Europeans are supposed to basically leave Latin America alone. And there's two places that didn't declare their independence during the Napoleonic Wars, and that's Cuba and Puerto Rico. And the Cubans began an independence movement in 1896 under Jose Marti, and the Spanish army is being brutal. They have what are called reconcentrados, reconcentration camps, or we would say in English, concentration camps. And they're putting civilians in here so that they can go after the supposed guerrillas who are outside of these camps. And hundreds of thousands of Cuban citizens are dying of exposure and disease and malnutrition. So there is genuine concern for the well-being of the Cuban people. But there's also concern that American property, sugar plantations are being, um, being, being burned in this fighting. And specifically, the Maine will blow up in, in 1898. And we're going to accuse Spain of being the cause of this. And that's going to be our justification. Now, after the fact, there's the argument that this is something good, kind of the social Darwinist idea of survival of the fittest, that some races are superior to others. And the Philippines is going to want independence, for example, from the United States, sort of thank you for getting the Spanish out and not leave us alone. And we're going to fight a war against Emiliano Aguinaldo, Armilio Aguinaldo, and an independence movement for four years. There's going to be about 100,000 dead Filipinos and another 5,000 American soldiers will die in this suppression of Filipino independence. And McKinley, when asked, you know, what should we do with the Philippines? He says we need to hang on to them. We need to democratize them. We need to civilize them. We need to Christianize them. We need to protect them from predator nations such as Japan or Germany. And behind all this, arguably, is are these ideas of having a springboard for trade into the rest of Asia and certainly it behooves an increasing industrial powerhouse to have power, to have colonies overseas. The, the, um, the overseas expansion, you could argue, begins in 1867 with the purchase of Alaska from the Russians. In 1890, Alfred Thayer Mahan writes a book called The Influence of Sea Power Upon History, very influential. It argues that a great nation needs a great navy, that if you're going to trade overseas, if you're going to have overseas commerce, you need a navy to protect your interests. The Yellow Press is the name of the provocative, sensationalist journalism that sold copy by villainizing Spain and Cuba, sort of highlighting the atrocities and provocations and certainly playing up the, um, the blowing up of the Maine in Havana Harbor in 1898. And you know the president during the Spanish-American War is uh, William McKinley and under him the first term Teddy Roosevelt is the assistant secretary of the Navy and he's going to resign his position, he's going to form the Rough Riders, his Dakota cowboy buddies and his Harvard polo friends and he's going to form this cavalry regiment that's going to capture San Juan Hill. The significance here is basically control of Santiago below the hill and the driving out of the Spanish uh, fleet from this harbor, which will be sunk by the American Navy. So uh, Teddy Roosevelt and the taking of, of San Juan Hill is kind of a big deal. He becomes a national celebrity, a national hero. And 
Um, the post-Spanish American Philippines Rebellion, okay, we already covered that. The Roosevelt Corollary. When Roosevelt becomes president, the Roosevelt Corollary is, whereas the Monroe Doctrine is European, stay out of Latin America, the Roosevelt Corollary is, we're the policemen of Latin America, certainly of the Caribbean. And when the Dominican Republic gets in trouble for falling behind on payment of its European debts, and there's sort of a threat that a European, Europe might, Europeans might invade, we invade. We take over the customs houses, the customs houses, and we arrange for the payment of the debt to angry Europeans. We become the gendarme of um, the Caribbean. Hawaii is seized by American sugar planters in 1893, and it's not until 1898, the year of the Spanish-American War, that McKinley will annex Hawaii. The Insular Cases and the Constitution refers to a series of Supreme Court cases ruling on the extent of citizenship and the rights that new subjects have in American territories. And the, the summary of these cases is the Constitution does not follow the flag. The Puerto Ricans, the people in Guam, the Philippines do not have the full rights of American citizens. The open door policy is um, under Secretary of State John Hay that the, um, it's U.S. policy, it's U.S. belief that China should be open to all for trade. In 1900, there's going to be a rebellion in China of a group of rebels <clears throat> angry at Western um, imperialism, Western cultural imperialism, and they're called, it's called the Society of Righteous and Harmonious Fighting Fists. It's one of the translations which gets shortened to the Boxers. And the Boxer Rebellion sees the besieging of several foreign embassies in Beijing, and McKinley sends 2,500 Marines as part of an international peacekeeping force that suppresses the Boxers and basically keeps China open for European and American interests. Dollar diplomacy under William Howard Taft is the idea that monetary investment will promote development and prosperity and trade and friendship for all. The Panama Canal is built specifically to get an American fleet back and forth between the two big oceans. We now have colonies in the Pacific, namely the Philippines. We need to get our ships fast from the East Coast and not have to go all around South America. The problem is Colombia owns Panama. Panama does have an independence movement which we aid, and that's a rebe has rebellion, re rebellion, this rebel movement, will be successful because of American military intervention. And of course, this new country will give us permission to build a canal. The Mexican Revolution in the early uh, 1900s is going to uh, see Woodrow Wilson intervening. We're going to arm several of these rebel groups, uh, angry that a dictator has taken over Mexico. It's part of this missionary diplomacy, this self-righteous, condescending, um, arrogant attitude of Woodrow Wilson that you know, we're going to teach other countries to elect good men. And one of the people that we back in the rebellion against um, Mr. Huerta, the dictator, is going to be Pancho Villa. And eventually when um, the um, I forget the name of the guy who takes over Mexico or, um, from, from Huerta. But Pancho Villa is cut off. Weapons are cut off to him. And he's going to cross the border in a place called Columbus, New Mexico. And he's going to shoot up the town and burn it. And he's going to kill 16 Americans. And we're going to send an American army running around the northern Mexican desert chasing him unsuccessfully. But the Mexican Revolution is, is um, you know, it's not a super big deal in the United States. There's a lot of refugees are going to flee across the border. But this becomes a big deal later, during, right before the uh, Americans enter World War I. During the war, the Germans are going to offer Mexico to get the Southwest back if they sign a, an alliance with them. And this is discovered in what's called the Zimmerman Note or the Zimmerman Telegram. So, you know, is it, any, is it realistic that Mexico is going to join with Germany and take the Southwest? No, but there's a, a civil war going on in Mexico with warlords and uh, some Pancho Villa shot up this American border towns, so it's kind of like the Germans are, are throwing oil on a fire next door that's still burning. In 1914, war breaks out in Europe. We don't join the war until 1917, and our reaction is one of neutrality, of isolation. But we're going to, we're going to sell to anyone, but the anyones are predominantly the Brits and the French. The Brits will blockade Germany, and we're making a lot of money selling to the Allies. 
and arguably were not truly neutral. In 1915, the Germans sink a British passenger ship, the Lusitania, and um, a lot of Americans die on the ship, and there's huge reaction in the U.S. The Americans are ready for war, and Wilson says something along the lines, there's such a thing as a man being too proud to fight. We maintain our neutrality, and we keep, uh, keep it together for two more years, and Wilson will successfully run on a platform for re-election of he kept us out of war. In 1917, we joined the war because Germany, which had pledged to leave merchant ships alone and was very careful not to sink American ships, began, it feels they're winning the war in 1917. For example, they've knocked Russia out of the war after Lenin signs the uh, Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, treaty that um, surrenders to the Germans. And the, the Germans feel that they can win against France and England before we can send enough soldiers over to turn the tide. They guess wrong. But they began sinking U.S. ships, and we do join in 1917. You've got that famous phrase, Lafayette, we are here. Um, General Pershing, John Pershing, is the leader of the American Expeditionary Force. He's going to say this when he lands in France. And this is kind of a, um, you know, Lafayette, uh, French, you helped us during the American Revolution. We're paying you back now. This is back when... France was, uh, we didn't have such bad attitude towards the French. The Spanish influenza, you should be aware of this, doesn't make a lot of history books. Between 1918 and 1920, approximately 500,000 Americans, and I've seen figures now, I'm uh, taping this during the Conrova virus from China. Part of the concern about this odd virus coming out of Asia is that it might turn into something like the Spanish influenza. And you see numbers that um, recently in the papers, there might have been eight, up to 800,000 Americans. This is just Americans. Worldwide, the low number you see is about 20 million in this two-year period. And this is a, was a lethal virus where my understanding is epidemiologists don't really know too much about what exactly this was. But a 10 to 20 percent chance you would die if you got this, this flu. It's called the Spanish influenza because during the war, the Allied countries did not let a whole lot of information out on this virus because they feared it would... Um, hurt American morale, and the information we got was largely out of Spain, for example, which was a neutral country, so the thinking is it must be coming out of Spain. So that's the Spanish flu. Um, something like half of the American soldiers who die in the war die of flu in the trenches. So this is a, this is a major disease. Um, Eugene Debs and the Socialists during the war, the Socialists are persecuted and harassed by the U.S. government under the Sedition Act. The Sedition Act of 1918 makes it a crime to criticize the government, its institutions, its symbols, and the socialists say this is a capitalist war on the back of the working man. There's no reason for Brits and French and Americans and Germans to shoot each other because the capitalists are just making money off this bloodbath. And the Sedition Act is one year earlier. In 1917, you cannot do anything which, which is aids the enemy. You cannot do something that hurts the American war effort. And the socialists are saying not to sign up for the, the draft, not to enlist. The WIB is the War Industry Board. This is the U.S. government is going to organize industry and trains to, um, to coordinate war production. The CPI is the Committee on Public Information. This is an official government propaganda agency to short film clips in uh, movie theaters and will, um, you know, posters and speakers around the country raising money for war bonds, for example. 14 points are Wilson's peace plan. And the plan here is a peace without victory, peace without losers, without winners. And it's um, from a German perspective, when things start going badly in 1917, 1918, the Germans think that the Americans, who at the time the war ends, we've got about 2 million soldiers overseas, they feel that Wilson is going to have a hand in giving them a generous, fair peace, which doesn't happen from a German perspective. The Versailles Treaty is a year later. So when you hear about the armistice that happens in November of 1918, the armistice is a truce. It's a ceasefire. The Versailles Treaty is an official end to the war. And in the Versailles Treaty, which the Germans are forced to sign under very unfavorable conditions to them, for example, they lose land and they lose population, they lose their military uh, might, they lose overseas colonies, they have to pay reparations. The League of Nations is a peacekeeping organization which Wilson envisions will stop future World War I. Um, keep in mind, at the time, it's called the Great War. And 
The Republican-controlled controlled Senate, no Republicans were invited over to this conference, even though this was a war fought by you know, millions of Americans. The Republican-controlled Senate does not back the League of Nations. They feel that a foreign um, organization should not force the United States to send soldiers again into war, except with American permission. And Wilson is not on board with this. He's for an international organization to have authority over the United States. And Henry Cabot Lodge, the leader of the Republicans in the Senate, is going to have what are called the reservations. He's going to say, we'll sign this as long as there's a reservation, as long as there's an asterisk, we will not send soldiers without permission of the U.S. Congress. And Wilson is adamant he, he opposes this. And the irreconcilables, those are led by Senator Bora, and they believe that this, tr this treaty is just bad. It's just a bad treaty. So Wilson, in his instrangence, his, his um, stubbornness, he, re he goes on a speaking tour. He has a stroke on this speaking tour in Colorado and spends the rest of his term as a sort of an you know, invalid in the White House, but that's another thing. Um, the, it, this does not pass the U.S. Senate because Wilson is unwilling to bend, unwilling to yield, unwilling to compromise. During the war, just two last thoughts here. For black Americans, huge migration north, getting out of the racist south, getting out of um, Jim Crow, and getting good jobs in factories, shortage of workers. Um, blacks are going to be enlisted or um, drafted into the military. They're largely going to be doing um, sort of non not largely non-combat work, things like working, um, you know, digging latrines and unloading ships and carting uh, war supplies around and pitching tents and whatever. But there is the 369th Regiment called the Black Rattlers. It was about... Um, uh, it, it's, it sees the highest number of casualties of any American regiment in combat. So there's this group which is symbolic that the, the black soldier is capable, is competent, even though there's the segregation that largely keeps them off of the front lines. What changes for women? Well, women work. Women take the place of men. They keep the, the, the shops, the farms, the businesses going. They take jobs in factories, and women become nurses. And there you have it. That's uh, our short review for Unit 11 on imperialism, Spanish-American War through World War I. Good luck, guys.